three, segment one, where we're talking about the mission of the church. And the mission of the church is primarily composed of three parts, evangelism, edification, and benevolence. And we're going to do some, of course, um, sub-points under those three. When we talk about evangelism, we realize that is the, the heartbeat of the church. It is definitely uh, something that the church must do in order to grow and expand. Is we must evangelize, we must tell others about the gospel of Christ. And the reason why is because of the universal need of salvation. In Romans 3, 9, 10 says, All people are under sin. All those who are of the accountable age have chosen to sin against God and to rebel against Him. And therefore, they're in need of salvation from sin. Romans 3, 23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Jews and Gentiles. And so we've all... We've all of that accountable age sinned against the Lord. And in Ephesians 2, 1 through 5 says that you were in your trespasses, your own trespasses and sins. So we're dead according to our own choice of sinning against God. It wasn't because of Adam's sin. It was because of my sin that I'm sadly spiritually separated from God. In Ephesians 2, 12 talks about that sinners have no hope and are without God in the world. But so we are in the universal need of sal we are in need of that uh, n that need of salvation for all people, and we see it as a case that when we talk about the gospel of Christ, the gospel is the only cure to this disease. There's nothing else that will save us from sin except the gospel. So it's God's power to save mankind from sin. Romans 1.16 points this out. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so it is the case that we see that it has the gospel has saving power, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, and that Christ seated at the right hand of God, and he, he showed that he had offered himself up as a, as a sacrifice for sin. And it's by his blood that we can be cleansed from the dominion of sin, for the power of sin. So 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 talks about the Corinthians were indeed saved by the gospel. They were they stood in it and they were saved by it. And Paul points that out. In Acts 11, 14, we see that there were words that were to save Cornelius. And you know, words always lead to faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God when it's sent something to him. So we see as a case that Cornelius had to hear, believe. And obey the gospel, which repentance unto life, confession, uh, which would imply confession of Jesus as the Son of God, and being baptized in water for the remission of sins. And so we see the gospel is God's power and salvation. First Corinthians 4.15 4, talks about how the Corinthians were begotten by the gospel. And Paul, how did he beget them? Through the word of truth. And that's what 1 Peter 1.23 also points out. And, of course, Jesus talks about in Luke 8, 11, how is the case that the Word of God is the seed of the kingdom. And when you place that in a good and honest heart, what germinates? Well, it germinates, hopefully, I pray, it, uh, of course, germinates into true faith, which will lead to obedience, uh, the, the love of the, of the sinner to God, who will want to comply with God's conditions in order to be pardoned. So evangelism definitely is the mission of the church. Now, we also see in Ephesians 3, 6 that you become a partaker of the promises of Christ when you obey the gospel. We also see in Acts 20, verse 32, what is the gospel able to do? It's able to give an inheritance among those who are sanctified, among those who are set apart. In 2 Timothy, Timothy 1, 10, the gospel, it's brought life and immortality. It's brought to life. You see, Jesus came to spiritually save us from sin. And so we're brought back into fellowship with God. But also we know that this body that we have, it, you know, it's subject to physical death. And Jesus conquered physical death. And he is the first fruits. Of, and we see that, uh, you know, that represented a harvest that it was to come later. And when Jesus returns... He's going to raise all physical bodies of the, both the righteous and the wicked from the graves. And we will each be judged by God 
and go to one of two eternal destinies, either heaven or hell. And so it's very important that we see that Jesus brought life and immortality and that this body, it, it, it's going to be transformed and fit for some eternal habitation. Sadly, some will go into eternal punishment, but some will go into eternal life. And so I hope that we want to be of those who have obeyed the gospel so that we can have that eternal life. Romans 16, 25 through 27 says, The gospel is made unto the obedience of faith. And so it's interesting that Romans begins with obedience of faith, ends with obedience of faith. And that's what true faith is. It's a faith that saves, it's a faith that obeys. You see that the church is God's agency in the work of evangelism. You see, when I become a Christian, I become a part of the, of the Lord's church. And so it's so very important for me to seek out and say, hey, I want others to come because it's the church that's the same. And so we need to we need to be that agency in the work of evangelism. You know, in Matthew 21 through 16, uh, Jesus compared the church to a, a householder who goes out as laborers into the vineyard. And, you know, we see as a case that there were all sorts of people who worked um, all sorts of hours. And so is the case that when I become a Christian, if I become a Christian early in life, then I know that I have so many more, uh, Lord willing, I hope I have so many more years in which I can dedicate my life in the service of the Lord to bring others to Christ. Sadly, there are people who become Christians later on in life, and one of the regrets that, regrets that they make is that they said, you know, I wish I had become a Christian. I wish I had, you know, been taught the truth earlier in life. But you see, we all, we all have to start somewhere. In Acts 13, 1 through uh, 3, we see that the church is the sending agency. We know that the church at Antioch sent uh, Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. And we know that they prayed over them. Uh, and that's what the church should do. Pray for missionaries. Pray for all of us as Christians as we go out into the world and as we try to shine, let our light shine before men. So that it makes you see good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 13, 3 through 9 talks about how the church is the sowing agency. We, we, we are now the sowers. We throw out the seed. We throw it on, of course, different hearts. And we know that sadly most people won't receive the word of truth. But there will be some, and we never know who. But we must continue persistently in faith, knowing that the word of God is powerful. If it could change Saul of Tarsus, it can change, it, can, it, can, it has the power to change so many other people who may, who may uh, be enemies of the gospel, so to speak. We know that we think about 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, where the Bible says the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. So here's the truth. Here's the church. It's the church that's going to bring forth the truth. Nobody else. Not scientists, uh, you know, they're not going to be people who out there in relief organizations that are going to bring forth the truth. It's the church because the church should know their Bible, and the Bible, of course, has contains in it the gospel. And so, we must be persistent in continuing to stand as that support because if the church doesn't do it, nobody else will. Ephesians 3 verse 10 says, the wisdom of God is made known to the church. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, think about this one body of Christ and how it contains males, females, Jews, Gentiles, young, old, uh, those who are poor, those who are rich, those who are, I mean, you name it. It contains all sorts of classes of people. I mean, and it's such a beautiful thing, like a diamond, where you can examine all of its intricacies and and you can also see just what God beautifully made. And so that's why we see that God is to be glorified in the church throughout all the ages. We should thank God for the church that he built, that he made, that we can become a part of. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 talks about 
the building up of the body of Christ is the mission of the church. Now, primarily this context is referring to the miraculous gifts that were to build up the church. But there's a principle here. There's a principle here that we're to ever keep on growing the church in its maturity, in growth, in love, in faith, and obedience. And that will lead to a mature uh, church. And so we must we must make that our primary goal. If, if we don't talk about the mission of the church, sadly the church will wither away or die. And so it must be important that we talk about always keep the mission of the church in the back of our minds. I mean, in the, in the sorry forefront of our minds because um, because that's how important it is. You see, uh, <clears throat> the personal evangelism. Now, when we talk about person, now this is our kind of our sub point. When we talk about personal evangelism. We see that Christian responsibility is individual in nature. You know, I can't depend upon someone else to do the job. I have to do the job. This is one of the reasons I became a missionary. I thought to myself, who, you know, I felt I felt the need to to evangelize to those in foreign lands and in the United States too. But I realized, you know, who's going to do this? I looked around. I have to do this. I need to do this. And we see that it is a responsibility of each and every one of us. In Matthew 25, 14, 15, Jesus gave the parable of the talents. And each man was responsible for what he did. You know, the man who had ten talents went out, made more. The man who had five talents went out, made more. The man with one talent, sadly, he he failed. He did not do he he, he did not do anything. He, and so we need to think about which one am I? Am I not the ten talent man? Not the five talent man? Not the one talent man? What will I do with what I've been given? Romans one fourteen talks about Paul's sense of responsibility. He he had this debt that he he's indebted to people to tell them about the gospel. And that's the way that we should feel as well. Now there is the means of fulfilling our personal responsibility. There is that, uh, of course, you know, we recognize that there is God has set in place the uh, you know authorized roles in the worship assembly and the Bible class uh, for adult groups that it is to be males. But we do know that there are there are time there are times when we can all talk to about the gospel to other people, and so we need to think about that. Uh, Romans one fifteen talks about that, and Acts twenty also, and so we see that Paul he taught, uh, you know, publicly and privately, and so that's something that we need to think about. So when we think about personal evangelism, we also think about that. <clears throat> We are to send others and hold up their hands in such work. We are to help one another. I mean, think about the example of the Philippians, how they held up Paul. They actually financially helped him along the way. We know that there is a necessity of sending someone. How shall they hear without a preacher? I mean, unless they are sent. I mean, you, you got to send someone so that others can hear the gospel and believe it and obey it. And then you have the influence of righteous lives and faithful service. That's the way that we can fulfill our personal responsibility of evangelism, and that our lives are letters read by others, and that sometimes we're the only Bible that people will ever read. We see that our Christian influence is compared to salt, to light, and that that, that may be the only thing that can help bring someone to Christ is by our example. Also, we see New Testament examples like Andrew. Who, who did Andrew bring? He brought... He, of course, brought Peter, didn't he? He said, come and see Peter. And he brought him, he brought, him uh, brought his own brother to Jesus. You see, Philip, what did he do? Philip went to Nathaniel and said, hey, we found, a, we found a Messiah. And then Paul, what does he do? He does everything he possibly can. He, 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 he goes through the, the cultural experience of, you know, of becoming all things to all people. And that's a legitimate sacrifice in order that he might be able to save others. You know, you see, when we think about the world, the world's the field. There's a, there's a whole, there's, our opportunities for such work are set, certainly unlimited. And so we need to really think about our vision should be global. Well, 
So when we think about being a successful soul winner, I want us to keep some things in mind. Here's some factors. Number one, the blessedness of it, of, of saving others. It's such a blessing. Two, we got to be persevering. we got to be like that person who goes out all hours of the day and never give up. We must have a love for the souls of men. We must care for them, just like Jesus did. We must be prayerful. We must pray to God, pray for us to have opportunity before us so that we can evangelize others. And we must know our Bible. That's how we're going to convince people of the truth. If we don't know our Bible, we're not going to be able to tell them about the truth. So that was the first main uh, part about the church, the mission of the church is evangelism. And then there's edification. And what respects are we to grow as Christians? Well, there's a lot of ways. In the grace and knowledge of the truth, in being like Christ, in love and knowledge and discernment, being quiet, that have a quiet, industrious, Christ-like character. And as priests, we're, as a spiritual house, we're offering up sacrifices to the Lord. That's how we edify one another. We also, in adding Christian graces, we need to add those graces add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, self-control. We must be. That's how we become more like our God. We must grow in the Lord and put on that whole armor, of God, and put on the breastplate, put on, hold the sword of the Spirit, and so forth. We must, we must uh, equip ourselves so that we can fight in the spiritual battle. We must grow in faith and love. We must grow in the ability to resist temptation. God always he will offer us the way of escape. We must believe that we can go through the way of escape, just like Joseph did. Joseph saw the way of escape and he took it. We must grow in our ability to serve and sacrifice, because that's what Jesus did. He was the ultimate servant. Some conditions of growth, and you know, when you think about growth, so there are things that hinder us from growing, and that is like 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2 talks about wickedness, guile, hypocrisy, envies, evil speaking. Those will keep us from growing. If we grow dual of hearing, then we won't have the word of God implanted in our hearts. If we give into youthful lusts, if we have love for money, friends, that will, that will hinder your growth as a Christian. We see that there are things that promote growth that will keep on growing you grow spiritually stronger. Like you keep on having a desire to peel milk of the word and you grow thereby. Have that spiritual appetite. You exercise, you you see how to live the Christian life and you and you actually walk it. You heed what you hear. You, you're careful on what you on what you are hearing. You're, you show diligence and active service. You have the right diet spiritually. You have the purity of growing your purity of mind and heart. In, of prayer and communion with the Lord. That's how we grow, friends, as a Christian. Well, there are certain avenues that through which the church may encourage growth. Number one, take thought for one another. Two, exhort each other. Three, remember the elders that they're to watch over our souls and say thank you to them for doing that. Four, encourage the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Admonish the disordered. Be long-suffering toward all. We must uh, attend the worship service. That's how we edify one another when you're there and I am there so that we may stir up one another in love and good works. And of course, attend the teaching program so that we can learn and apply more. And then there's the benevolent part. So we have evangelism, edification, and benevolence, helping others. And then the lesson I'm taught by Christ, such as the parable of the Good Samaritan, to be a neighbor to men. To have the opportunity to do, good, to do good to one who is in need. So there are some bases upon which such work is to be done. That we can be self-consecrated. That we have a love for each other. And that we prove our love by our liberality and our generosity toward them. We show our thank, uh, gratitude. We have sympathy for one another. For those who are in need. And it glorifies God. And that's something that we need to think about. And to keep our hearts centered on God. Now, the New Testament operation part of this is that it can be on an individual basis, in which I, as an individual, can help somebody, and like Dorcas did. It can be done on a congregational level, in which that's what the church did, in sending relief to uh, various churches, helped the church in Judea. 
we see the congregation cooperation where certain congregations of Galatia were helping, the, you know, with Achaia, were helping the church in Judea. And so that's something we need to think about. Of course, the plans for raising our funds, 1 Corinthians 16, 1, 2. We have the placement. We'll, we'll talk more about giving later, but we have the placement. That's the, the money is contributed to the common treasury in the church. And there's that period where it was done on the first day of the week since that's when they came together to break bread, to take the Lord's Supper. There is the personal, each one of us. It's proportionate. It's as we have prospered. And it's out of the willingness and purpose and confidence of the heart. And so I hope you can see what the mission of the church is. You see, it's evangelism. The heartbeat of the church is evangelism. It's edification, build each other up to remember the mission. And then benevolence, in which that is actually also part of evangelism, in that you know, if you help somebody physically in need, they might be more willing to be open up to you uh, to to hear what the gospel says. And so, I'd like for us for a discussion questions to think about these. Define the word evangelism. What's the universal need of everyone, and why? What is God's only appointed means to save the world? With truth. Is there a Christian responsibility in evangelizing? If so, why? Name ways in which one may fulfill his responsibility for evangelizing others. What are some methods? Number six, define the word edify. Number seven, in what and how are Christians to grow? Eight, specify ways that can hinder growth. Number nine, how may the church encourage growth in the grace and knowledge of Jesus? Number ten, give references that indicate that the early church cared for those who were needy or poor. So. I hope that this is, lesson has been helpful to you, and uh, I hope you have a good time in discussing these questions.